So welcome back to another uh, Join the Brave podcast. It's the, the big one today. We've got the gaffer in. How you doing, Ricky? You good? I'm good, yeah. Yourself? You all right? Ah, not too bad, coping in the, the circumstances. Um, I feel like we've spoken about it a lot recently, especially with yourself. But um, see, thinking about personally, how are you coping with the whole pandemic, you and your family and things like that? Um, I don't know. We try to take the positive out of it. Uh, I think last week was um, difficult, and I use that word mostly because there's there's a lot more people in the world who are going through much worse than I am, um, and finding things a lot more difficult than certainly I am. It was difficult from your point of view on a personal level. Andrea's working, my wife Andrea's working in the house, and I'm obviously trying to get things done, and the, the, the three kids are in the house, so. And they're still obviously trying to get through school work and all that. So yeah. um, we've been kind of staging it. You know, I've been getting up really early in the morning uh, to kind of do the bits and pieces I need to do. Still academy players over at the moment. So there's still, there's still things that are, are going on um, with them. Obviously, we can't uh, go over and see them, but we can do it remotely. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's been a challenge, but we're trying to be positive. But actually, see, last week's part towards the end, we got into a good rhythm, and it's been really good to spend time with the kids and mm. give them a bit of daddy schooling, you know. But uh, <laughs> getting them going, do homework, you know, <laughs> proper work. So, analysis, so that, them. no, no, I got Gene, <laughs> the, the, the six year old, he was, I told him to do a session. Okay. Uh, so he wrote, drew me up a wee session. It was good. That it's a real stuff he does it and you and you club and things. So um, <laughs> try to be creative with that. But the the positive for us is we're spending time that we never really get a chance to spend proper time with. And I'm in every night and you know I'm helping out with all the bits and bobs that, that I would normally help out with. So from that point of view, it's it's been positive. But obviously, you know we're all looking forward to getting back to kind of normality and hopefully that's sooner than later. And I mean. Um, there is a lot more lost people than ourselves, for sure. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you th- like just touching on the Braves guys? Like, we'll we'll talk about your like how you've built this team yourself. But have you been really impressed with how these guys have kind of coped with it and the things they've been doing for you while they've not been at training, things like that? Have you been impressed? I, I mean, there, there, I've said it before. I mean, you've spoke about it, and and we all have, you know, like right the way through, you know, to Chris and myself, yourself how good a group the boys are, you know, as uh, forgetting about football players as, as, as young guys and older guys and uh, human beings, I suppose, how good a group of boys they are. And um, in this challenging time, uh, that obviously tests that. I, spoke, I made a point to phone them all at the weekend, spoke to them personally, just to find out really how they are, not really to update them about anything, but just to, to speak to them and just ask if there's anything I can do. So there's a couple came back to me and asked if I can do some bits and bobs analysis and that with them. So, which is great. It's great yeah. for me to hear. Um, but they're all positive. They've all been fine. They're all, all their families are, are fine. Um, so, you know, for that side of things, that's that's, that's a huge positive for us. Cool. Well, let's kind of move on from that and just talk. We'll, we'll start with, we'll go, we'll start with some brave stuff and then we'll go into you personally. But uh, could you maybe just give a, a small sum up of the season, like because it's been such a positive year. Like, does it has it been your best year? Well, you've been part of this the uh, sport and the Caledonian Braves club. Like, does it beat uh, one in the South of Scotland League, or is it just a completely different year? That you can't put it against. It's that? different. It's a different. Obviously, it's. I mean, we we had the sport and even the Braves kind of last year. Although we weren't the Braves, it was last year was maybe the first year of us becoming a a, a proper semi professional club, if you like. Um, Winning the league was was fantastic. I, I mean, like people think, like okay, it's tier six of the Scottish leagues. But for me personally, and for the guys involved, and um, for the all the hard work behind the scenes for Chris, you know, myself, Kanzo at the time, and everybody at the academy, it was it was huge. And I, I'd made that something that an objective that I was pretty obsessed with trying to achieve, and we achieved it. And we got promoted, and then obviously the the, the last few years have, have been good. I think we've showed steady progress. I, I think I would have liked to uh, have shown a bit more progress last year. I think we were unlucky with a number of things. But I think we've progressed a lot this year. Um, I think the league's a lot stronger. You know, and you can obviously look at league position and things like that. And think we're okay, but we're only you know a place above where we were. But in reality, this the league's a totally different animal this year. And the biggest progression is for me has been the environment, and that's been created 
um, not just by myself and the coach and staff and Chris, etc., um, but the players. And yeah. it's testament to the players. And I worked really hard in the summer to find out you know, what the players were all about personally. Because that's the building blocks. And I had to get that right. I had to get that part right. Because I felt I didn't get it as well as I could have done the year previous. Um, but I think this year I had to get that right. And I, I feel I've done that. And it gives us a basis to go and progress. Yeah, just just kind of talking about that. Is that it, so that you you probably started building this team maybe a year ago, maybe just before this time, like a year ago. Is it planned out the way you thought as soon as you started building that squad for Colin? Um, yes and no. Um, it's planned out to the mm-hmm. sense where that I think it's planned it pretty well. I think I've got managed to get the players in that I wanted. I, I missed out in quite a few um, for various different reasons. It was very, very difficult to convince players to come to a team who had no signed players mm-hmm. at the time. So around about this time, April, May, uh, it's more into May, to be honest, because you know, the academy was still going on and the, they were, were trying to figure out what we were going to do for, for, for this coming year, uh, so a year ago. Um, I really kind of put an effort into going out to games and I was out to games, you know, most nights of the week, actually, you know, the juniors were kind of coming through midweek games, so there was a lot of games. Um, I think it's panned out for the best possible way for the moment and I'm glad the way it has worked out, uh, the way it has and, uh, you know, and, and it, was, it just took a lot of kind of endeavour and hard work and um, graft to, to get the boys to, to sign up and you know understand like it's not about money this is going to be something different like we're trying to sell the club as something a little bit different I think we've achieved that uh, so far don't get me wrong I always want more points um, I always want a better run in the cup um, so from that side of things I would have liked to if we're talking about results I would have liked to have um, progressed you know another round or two of the Scottish Cup but um, that was that was obviously a big disappointment for the year, but there has been other progressions which I did feel that I expected, and other ones that maybe I didn't expect. Yeah, I think that's been kind of the, the kind of aim of the year was to make the progression. So I think we've done that in a good, positive way in a lot of ways, like you mentioned there. Um, but it's it, it's just kind of let's see how it goes next year and continue on, isn't it? Because we've, yeah. we've yeah. built the good foundations this year, and you don't know where it's going yeah. to be. But foundations is one thing, Roy, as you know, and it's it's the next part's key as well. Uh, we've got to show progression. I think um, we can't, next year we can't say we're a new club, we're going to face other challenges mm. in terms of, you know, with, with this, uh, the, the, the state of affairs with the coronavirus, etc., that everybody's going to struggle with. So that's going to add a, a certain challenge to, to everything, the academy plus the first team as well. But we've got to, hit, you know, we've got to be bullish with things like that. It's, um, and I try and tackle everything like that. Any issues, any challenge that comes up, we need, we need to be bullish. Face it head on and don't shirk it and, and look to still make those progressions that we want to make because uh, it's, it's too important for me personally, for the club, for the Chris, the academy, everybody involved, coaching staff, so et etc. Uh, it's too important for us not to try and progress. Yeah, so... I was just hoping that we can keep doing that and keep a, a good squad together and keep going the way we are because it's, it's a really positive environment to be around. I'm sure you'll agree. Well, let's kind of let's go on to a bit about you. Um, why, what made you want to go into coaching when you were coming to the end of your career? What made you to make that decision to jump into it? Well, well actually, I, I was kind of doing bits and pieces of coaching. I, I played, um, I was playing with Clyde at the time. And um, the head of youth had said, do you fancy coming into a bit of coaching? And I thought, I think I will. And I wasn't really at the end of my career. And I'd actually coached before when I was playing abroad, bits and pieces, just to, for honesty, just to get a bit of extra cash. And it was coaching mm-hmm. wee kids at schools and private schools and international schools and that in Singapore. And um, so I'd done a bit of that. And I quite liked coaching and think more, more so at that point was thinking about coaching, thinking about how to construct a session, et cetera. And I thought when the Clyde opportunity came up, you know, and I was still playing, I was a full-time player at the time, um, with Clyde, who were full-time at the time, and um, I just thought I I quite liked the idea of it. So I came in and just worked in kind of assistant coach, really, Mm -hmm. Um, just coaching and getting on the pitch and working out what, what, you know, 
I was good at and what I wasn't good at. And, you know, at that point, I wasn't good at most things to do with coaching, but that's, you know, you, 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 that's why you do it. Um, and I wanted to start off on the youth side of things to, to help me progress and get used to speaking in front of people, get used to the tactics board, small things that, you know, as a player, you probably take for granted, but it's those wee things that, that can ultimately make a difference. Yeah, did you see from that point that you'd go on and go get your pro licence? Uh, did you ever see that coming? Or was it just never thought step? Never thought my pro licence, but I knew one thing. Uh, I knew I wanted to stay in the game. Mm. I knew my career was an okay professional football career. Made a career out of it. Relatively average player. But I was lucky enough to continue playing until I was 32 or 33. But I knew even when I was about 30, I thought, you know what, I, I fancy kind of going into coaching. But I just thought, you know what, let's don't put any pressure. Let's work away at it. Keep coaching in the background. Keep coaching the youth. And um, I tried to, I went on my B licence. And I really enjoyed that experience. That was a good challenge. And the SFA guys in there do a really good job of, um, you know, setting you up. Um, to, to be a coach and they give you the, the tools and they give you the challenges and I felt you know at that point that was a real point I thought you know what there's a career here I would I would like to um, I would like to pursue it. Have you noticed with maybe as you've you've grown as a manager and a coach that you're you're maybe imaging some of your old managers or do you think you've taken a different approach have you taken anything from them or are you going your own kind of way? I think you do. I mean, it's like your parents, isn't it? You think, yeah. I'll never be like my parents, but you probably end up being a bit like your parents, you know, yeah. um, which can be a good thing or a bad thing, depends. But I, I think I tried to take another approach when I was doing the kind of end thing, you know, and then book for my, my pro license. I tried to think back and take a bit more, um, I suppose, selective approach to how all my manager, previous managers were. You know, one main thing about the ones who who done well, I thought, was to try and remain, you know, calm. To, uh, they all had their moments, for sure, at half-time, at full-time. As I think you've seen me have that at times, but that's just emotion. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's for the good of the squad that they need to hear that. But um, a lot of, some of my coaches and managers I've had have had the real ability to just you know, win, lose, or draw, just remain the same mentality, keep keep faith in the players. And that's that is one of the hardest things um to, to do. And that's certainly something that I've that I've took from managers in the past, negatives as well. You know, I've had managers have never coached me, you know, just put give you a formation on your go, lads, and you kinda of played off the you know, off the cuff, you played in a structured way because you kinda of figured it out for yourself and there is merit in that as well. Um, but I think and one thing I try and do is try and get the balance between letting the boys give the boys the enough um, information that that, 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 that that they need to know, but also they need to figure the game out for themselves. Because I, you know, ultimately I can't control the way the ball moves and the opposition moves on a Saturday. So I try and find that balance as much as I can. Cool. You've you've ended up went and having a really good coaching career from a from when you started off. So you were at uh, teams like Queens Park, Motherwell, St Mirren, and Rangers before properly coming in with the Braves. Um, have you have you had any players that you've worked with like over those years that have kind of went on to have really good careers or, and you kind of feel like you've played a part in them going to where they are? Uh, I mean, the, like we spoke about it before, but like I've been really fortunate. On one side, I've coached with a lot of clubs, like, like you say, Queen's Park, um, uh, Motherwell, up to Rangers. Um, in Hearts for a wee spell as well, and in one hand you're thinking you kind of went from club to club, but I stayed for three at Rangers for nearly three years, and I was really fortunate in that particular time to work with some brilliant players. Queens Park, looking back at that, the obvious one is Andy Robertson, who who done you know, I mean you can't even describe it in any words. Um, so I worked with Andy for, uh, Andy Robertson for a year. Um, I can't say for sure that I, I would take credit, you know, for him to have a career. Definitely not. That's down to him. Mm. And certainly a big part of play is the first team managers who give any player their opportunity. Um, but I do, I do think the fact, you know, in that particular time um, at Queen's Park, there was there were a few players. There was Andy Robertson, obviously, who's, who's done ever so well. 
Um, Blair Spittle, who's done, you know, made a career at the game. He's playing in the Premier League with Ross County now. Lon Shankland, obviously, who's doing fantastic. Mm. Um, there's others who are dotted about, and I never would have thought at the time that particular squad at Queen's Park would have went, went on and done so well. Um, at Rangers, I worked with the, the lad Billy Gilmore, who was a phenomenal young boy to work with. Um, again, I don't, I don't, I'm not really into these coaches who say, you know, I, I'm taking credit for that. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm so fortunate to have worked with these boys, and actually, I see the likes of Billy more so than anybody. Um, you didn't need to coach him. You just needed to give him the the tools on a training session, and you had to put a good enough training session on for that type of player that it ticked all the boxes for him, and he was getting enough out of it. Um, it wasn't necessarily a good talent to do this or talent to do that. He was a good enough player to figure everything out for yourself. You just you just had to create that coaching environment, and he would and he would flourish in it every time. And same with all the better ones, Andy Robertson, etc. Um, Chris Cadden at, at Motherwell as well. But I've been really fortunate to work with some mm. of these guys um, who've been, you know, one of the, the major factors about them, they've always been brilliant boys. You know, there's never been an idiot amongst them. They've always worked hard. You know, they've always had their own personality. And there's more, I think there's more coming through in at Rangers from the, the O2 team that I worked with as well. We had Kai Kennedy, brilliant player, Bapo, Emma Boody, um, all these boys, Josh McPake, really, really good. Nathan Patterson, who's made his, uh, his debut as well. So, long way that continue for them. I, like I say, I, I certainly don't want to take credit for them, uh, for it, but I, and I do feel I'm fortunate working with the guys. Yeah. Uh, and I hope, I hope that any information that I've gave them has, has helped them in their, their, their careers. And you know, I just want them to have a, a really long professional career playing at the highest level. So, you know. Yeah. Um. Obviously. Billy Gilmer's had a lot of praise recently from a lot of people just coming into the the Chelsea team. Do you think it's Mm -hmm. um, a player that you knew was going to make it really quickly at that level? Or did you think it might have taken him a bit longer to kind of get into the first team? When he went to uh, Chelsea at the moment, when they had their transfer embargo, he's had that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, For for Billy, I I can honestly say I I didn't have any doubt that he he would make it. He, He just had that I don't know how, he, he was just different, just star, a bit of star quality really, you know, his parents were grounded and uh, his family was really supportive that way, but he just had something different, Some and amongst really, really good players at the time, but you always wonder, you can never, can tell, you're thinking, right, okay, he goes down to Chelsea, and at the time they're obviously got millions and millions of pounds and world-class class players in his position, so you're thinking, how's that young lad going to get in there? Obviously, with like you mentioned, the, the tra- transfer embargo, etc., and, and ultimately, regardless of that, Frank Lampard, as a manager, has gave a young boy who he believes in a chance to go and play, and and so far, well, he's paid that back. Yeah. Do you? Is that something you look at yourself as a manager as well? Like you, you brought a lot of youthful players in this year. Is that something you want to continue with? Is would you always kind of? Looking into the future, I think you'd always look at a youthful team with yeah. some experience more than just a kind of mixed squad. Yeah, no, I, that was the way I looked at it. I felt I, I know myself. I'm, I'm, I feel I'm, I'm one of my, my kind of forties is working with youth players, but with that, you need the right types of uh, I call them influencers. So the influencers in our dressing room: your Alan Reid, Ross McNeil, David Winters, David Sinclair's, um, you know that that type of boy. Mm. Um, who can have a real positive influence on the rest of them, and they also can have a real negative influence. But the younger ones, you can mould them a wee bit more. Uh, like I say, you've always got to give them that environment, that, that kind of culture to, to work from, um, and trust, obviously, uh, to go and play. And I feel I, I think I've done that relatively well this year. Um, but the younger players, if you're building something, it's not about building it for one year. And compare us to other squads who have maybe brought in a lot of experienced boys. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But for for me, I felt you know for this year, I don't think we're in the place to go and win the league, you know, this season. But over the next two, three, four seasons, we should be if we can keep everybody on board and build it and add quality as we go. Um, we should be with these young players. Uh, in a better position than most just because we've taken our time and, and built that foundation and built that culture, built that environment uh, through the years. Yeah, that's sort of like what I was saying. It's just something that we're, we're 
we're all kind of excited about the club and it's um you can see the the environment of what we've all brought together that it's possible it's really possible and something we spoke about with um Roscoe and Sinky was the kind of acceptance of the club because obviously there's been a lot of um kind of chat about the club having no fans you know the new name and I know personally you weren't a fan of the name at the very start as well and do you think it was just because of the way we play, because of the results we've had, do you think that the acceptance into the Scottish game has been a bit quicker? And you, we've kind of lost a lot of the haters, if you will, over the way this season. Yeah, I mean, I'm not too aware of the haters, I suppose. But you know, I, I you know, at the end of the day, fuck them. You know, like if, <laughs> if 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 they don't want to, if they don't want to support the club, then then don't support it. But I don't think they've got too much to say now. I mean, you think. The work you know Chris has done in terms of putting the club into where it's at now, in terms of the evolution of Edith Sport Academy, there's no another club that's evolved that quickly and got to where we've got. Now you could easily say you could easily come to a ground like Berwick Rangers done that time and you know whoever that lad was and posted a couple of pictures and you know was quite negative about um, our setup. But you know from where we've been, you know we've not had 120 years of history to build anything up. So you know we've had essentially four or five years, but really the Braves, it's the first year, and it's the first year at Alliance Park, and it's only going to get better for that side of things. So I think the negativity is now starting to um, move to more, maybe more acceptance, um, but that type of thing doesn't bother me. What, what I want to get to is, as people respect us as a good football team, as an ambitious football team, as somebody who's a real threat to eventually go and, and win the league. And I think if we can get to that point, then we're doing something right. Right. So we'll go back onto the base just towards the end of it. But what um, I've been setting the guys some questions and I sent them to you as well just to see what you kind of came up with. Um, I, I changed the word into the first question a bit to see what you think. But do you think, what would you say? Would you pick two players or two coaches that you had to be isolated with, keeping your government regulations have been a couple of metres apart each time? But who would you want to maybe spend some time with and just kind of pick their knowledge or even oh. if it's past players, things like that? Who would you go for? I like, I like how you asked me if it was coaches or uh, players. It wasn't Aye. like supermodels or that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know? um, but I, I mean, the interesting one for me, coach-wise these days, I mean, you can speak about Guardiola and I mean, Klopp. I mean, that, that guy, he talked about everything that we've just spoke about there, mm. Jurgen Klopp. I think he he would need to be one, you know. His enthusiasm, his, his you know, the way he has his personality, and I, I could I, I could ask him, you know, questions all day. I think mm-hmm. the other one I like is Marcello Bielsa uh, uh, Leeds. Okay, yeah. He, he annoyed me a wee bit with that carry on. He was going, he was going on about looking at. Um, Spying on folk at Derby. Yeah. Uh, it was Dar- Derby session, wasn't it? Yeah. Before he's before one of the, the kind of playoff games or the promotion games, lead up games. So you know me a wee bit with that. I don't like that type of thing. I think it's dishonest. Um, yeah. But probably they two would be an interesting. But Martella Bales, he, he, I think he's well known to have, you know, to, to be a different coach. And I, I really admire that. He plays a kind of different formation for most type of players. He has this real real, real belief in what he's doing um, and that transmits to his players and that transmits to success and, you know, that like he's, that, that's different. For me, it's a different stratosphere, that type of guy. Um, we should talk about a player. I don't know, one of my favourite other players was Eric Cantona. I think yeah. he would bring his bottle of champagne. We could have a few glasses of that and we could get a chat about Man United and yeah. things like that and his career because he was another one of those guys, you know, like, you know, nobody, nobody told him, you know, like no. he was he was just a man. He was a, such a big ego, obviously, but a top, top player. And I think if you got to know him, I obviously didn't know him, but I did speak to a couple of guys who did um, share a dressing room, fought something with him, and he just said he was an absolute gem of a, of a guy to work with and an absolute genius of a player. So those, those would, would be my picks. I'll give you three, Roy, is that all right? Three, three's good. you got two coaches and a player. Uh, so if you had to pick... Um, a previous game to rewatch all the time. Obviously, there's no live football at the moment. You're um, you have to rewatch some old games. Maybe one you played in. Maybe one you you remember going to when you were younger. But or just one you watched on the telly. What what kind of stands out as a game that you'd want to watch relentlessly? Um, as you know, I'm a, I, I do like 
you know, Scottish football. I mean, there's obviously some huge games that have been like you think back, you know, the Liverpool Milan one and things like that. But yeah, I was go- I was it was a good question, and it was one that I thought you know I want to pick up pick one that I was actually at. Okay. The one I wasn't at this particular game, um, but England Scotland the uh, it was two two down at Wembley. I was, yeah. you know that that game. I, I remember watching that and having that kind of real emotion about um, about that particular game. Um, there's been other Scotland games I've not been at, like the, the one against France, etc. I wasn't at that, so it didn't it doesn't kind of incite the same sort of kind of emotion and passion. Although I, I watched it. Mm. Um, one when I was working at Rangers, I went to the League Cup uh, semi-final, Rangers v Celtic, and I don't want to don't speak of the old firm, but you know, like I obviously worked up at Rangers, and it's nothing against Celtic at all. I admire them massively as well. But the, the, the Mark Warburton was a coach at the time; he was a manager at Rangers, and uh, I think they played. Celtic Rangers was in the, the championship at the time. Celtic were obviously in the Premier League, um, and Ronnie Dial was their manager. And they weren't doing brilliant, but Rangers came in that particular day. And what I really like about Mark Warburton is, is he came to Rangers and he, and he he had his style of play and he stuck to it, you know. And he got a bit of criticism for different things for the media saying this and that, whatever you know, and maybe twisting his words a wee bit, but. Um, he came, he had a real philosophy, a thought process, a, a methodology on the game and the way he wanted his team to play and his team played like that and Noah and the shout before the match was his team couldn't play against you know, a better side than Celtic who were a team of internationals at the time and obviously the final game finished 2-2 and Rangers won <clears throat> excuse me, on penalties um, <clears throat> but the I think the thing for that game is Matt Warburton could easily no stuck to his principles and just started to kind of play a different style of play that maybe, you know, was more defensive minded in terms of he was setting up to play against Celtic, who were the champions. He didn't, he went out and done it. And I admired that so much. He played for the back, you know, some might say overly, but his team are absolutely unbelievable on that day. And um, like I say, it's not really a Rangers or Celtic thing, but I remember being at that game and the atmosphere and the, the Rangers supporters obviously desperate to get one over Celtic. They'd been out of the league for a long, long time. And uh, the players on that day who were, you know, no brilliant players, but they, they'd done it. There was a real team ethic about that day. And I always kind of, I've watched that game a few times. And it's no about Rangers again, but it was more, I um, mean, I was a Rangers fan when I was a boy, but... Um, nowadays it doesn't really bother me but that particular game is a game of football mm. um, and the different kind of rides of emotion and things that that kind of created was was unbelievable um, so that would probably be a game that I look back and I think for a coaching perspective as well and even a supporter's raw emotion that type of perspective mm. that you think you know it was such a brilliant game uh, to, to you know to watch again so I would I would, I would definitely watch that one again there's, there's others out there there's so many you know, yeah, there's so many can choose from. It's really difficult. The Scotland game, I can agree with that. I think that's one that is a, it kind of made everyone a bit more patriotic about the national team again for a bit because it kind of died out. Uh, and I think only, I don't know, just because we're playing England, um, but I yeah, think everyone kind of came together again. The only time I'm a football fan, I would say, is when Scotland are playing, hmm. um, where I go to the stadium if I can get to the game and you know watch the game as as a supporter, if you like, rather than analysing it. Yeah. Um, I know, I know me and Chris and uh, a couple of other guys were at the uh, the last Scotland-England game at, at Hamden. Um, I think it was Harry Kane scored in the last second. So that would have been one, but a lot of the Scotland games give you a lot of hurtful moments. Yeah. So so it's yeah. difficult to go and watch them back, you know, yeah. unless you're prepared to go through the hut again. <laughs> Just cut uh, off the last two The Italy game a few years back as well. You yeah, know, yeah. so much, so close. The old saying, isn't it? So far away, so That's close, right. but so far. Do you see the national team just kind of going on to something different? But do you see the national team getting success in the next couple of years? Do you see the kind of youth kind of set up he's got going? Yeah, in? I do. I do. I believe. I definitely believe in it. I, but I just feel, I don't know, man. I just feel people need to be more positive about the whole thing. Like, mm. and I'm talking about the media, I'm talking about everybody, and they'll argue that, well, they need 
something positive to write about, but it just seems like any wee thing that gets shot down, I think we can yeah. change change the rhetoric a wee bit on that and um, and start to think a wee bit more positively about the whole thing. I think Steve Clark was a good appointment, but he needs time, he needs time, he needs he needs real time to go and build that. That's not going to be a job that happens in the next year or two, that's got to be a job that's four or five years down the line and it's looking, it gives him the opportunity to, to say, right, okay, I know I've got that time, I'm going to look at the younger players. That's the best case scenario. Scottish football isn't really like that, but that would be, that would be what I would like to see because there is those players. Look at McTominay, you know, uh, John McGinn. I mean, you know, sit, you know, sit man, man. You see, you see, you know how far they, he's progressed as a player. Kenny McLean, all these guys, um, Billy Gilmore coming to, come to the fore, and um, you know, Jinky could go in. Billy McGinn. Again? Jink, Billy Gilmore should go in. I think he's uh, still a bit young. Or, uh, a lot of, a lot of people know. are saying it's not. Maybe they're not football kind of guys. They're just they just, yeah. just supporters. But is I think it might be or? quite early. I think yeah. it might be quite early. I think I would like to see him get fifty games in the Premier League before he gets he gets close to the, the international team. It's not to say that you can't get in the squad. I think. Um, Why push him in too early and he kind of ruins it? Ah, it's not even maybe ruin it, but just he will have a lot to deal with at Chelsea just now. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it needs to be staged in like any young player you know that they know you can't expect a young player to just go in and, and play see if in saying that if it was to, to get stuck in I'll get absolutely no doubts he'll go and deal with that no problem. yeah cool well, we'll, we'll get two questions I'll kind of non-football related before we finish up so um, do, you, do you have any TV shows or films you'd watch all over again uh, just because you there's nothing really new on the telly just now with the pandemic what would you what would you binge watch? Um, my favourite of all time was I, I think the, the all the series have gone gone a bit too far. They, they, you end up with like twelve series, you know. Yeah. And I, I get bored by the time that happens. Yeah. But I used to watch the last kind of big series. That, well, it's not the last one actually. I watched Breaking Bad, but um, me and my sisters watched um, years back when we just kind of first started doing it. Um, a program called The Wire. Okay. And I don't know if you've seen the wire, but the wire's growing. You know, it starts off quite slowly, and it's essentially like in a cop drama, which I'm not really into. But like, um, it was quite, it was really quite gripping. And it's you probably my description is not doing it justice. You would need to sit and watch it and watch mm. the first episode or two. Um, basically about a kind of cop drama and um, about how they deal with kind of different scenarios, um, drugs and all that type of thing. Um, but it's really kind of, uh, I wouldn't say intense, but it's kind of uh, a bit thought-provoking as well. But I think some of the newer box sets and things are just kind of, they're fine just to kind of easy watch and things like that, but uh, I'm not really one for them. I've not watched The Wire back. Me and the missy have been talking about it for ages, so maybe yeah, that, now is maybe the time. <laughs> we might get that done. Uh, the next one was, uh, I know you're a bit, you, you fancy yourself as a good cook yourself, but um, what what would you what would you cook a lot? Like, what's the you have to stockpile for a bit? Like, and you could only cook this one meal for a while. What would you go for? What's your speciality? No, you're right. I do like a bit of cooking. It takes me away for the morning children, um, yeah. and it kind of focuses my mind a wee bit on something which I like. Um, what would I make? Don't know. It'd be a curry, quite good at yeah. old curry, the scratch. Okay. Oh, okay. But, you know, you need you rice need a bit mild or a. Eh? Well, I like it spicy, but it, like I'm I'm cooking for five in this house, you know, so that they, they they're uh, they, they've got different, you know, appetites and things. <laughs> so they, don't, they don't like they always, the always the younger ones don't like the spice so much. But probably a curry, I or a, a roast or something like that. I like Aye. um a roast, a good one. Aye. Roast, and I like a roast chicken with, with you know the, the roast potatoes and things like that. Right. You can't beat that. So no. I don't know. I can't narrow it down to one. Right. But I reckon if I was to get a, a, a lot of ingredients, I could make a few dinners. Right. Well, um, but, uh, like you're saying, I do fancy myself. But yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> once this all dies down, <laughs> and, and, you, and, and you're not going anywhere, or, and I've made it a job, then I might just turn to that. I don't know. What about the a lot of the boys have said the mince wraps uh, down at Lance Park? Would you would you know include that in your uh, kind of weekly meal? 
Uh, well, you see, it's important that I, for you to know that Ennis makes them. But that was actually right. something I made for the lads year, a couple of years ago. Uh -huh. um, so I'm most definitely taking credit for that idea. <laughs> Although I think Ennis has raised the bar. I think she's added a bit of other bits and pieces right. to, to the men's to, um, to make it better. But the boys, <laughs> the proof's in the pudding, isn't it? The boys all love it, or most of them love it anyway. So kind of can't uh, deny that. But. Yeah, well, we were talking in the one with Sinky and Roscoe, just that's something that's maybe a bit, that you've implemented that's maybe a bit different from other clubs. They were saying that the boys are coming in early and the boys are staying late after training to kind of mingle, talk, you know, you're all having a laugh, you're all having your mince wraps. Is that a good thing for you, just looking back in the whole season that we've had that kind of togetherness and at, at training? Um, and yeah, I, I wanted that. It was, so, it was so vital for us to get that room, uh, the hospitality room, and for us to use it, get the telly up, which is brilliant, so they can watch, you know, something they can come in. You know, so you're not feeling that you're, you're rushed. You're feeling, right, okay, I've got a bit of time. I can have a, have a cup of tea. I can have a bite to eat before or after training. I can do some stretching. There's a wee bit of space. And that, that helps create that environment of you know, speaking to each other and that bit of trust that you kind of build up the camaraderie and things like that. Um, it's That was so, so important for me and, and, and the food we're kidding on about the men's traps, but it's great because Aye. the boys can just go and help themselves. They've had a long shift at, at their work through the day. They don't want to feel that they're, they're getting pushed in and out, so that they've got that little bit of time just to get a chat. They can speak about the game or whatever. We'll also use that room for, for a bit of analysis as well when, when we choose to do that. So that, that's been, I can't underestimate how huge that has, has been for, for us as a squad, you know. So um, I, I do feel I do feel that is hopefully a difference to, to other clubs. I know a lot of other clubs, they just turn up to a training facility, they're, they're booked, and then that's them in the train and, and back out again. And, you know, I feel we've got an opportunity to do a bit more than that. Yeah, um, so just we'll just finish up, and you can give us some of your kind of last comments and how how you think, you, you know, for you the the years being has it been positive, um, and maybe just kind of mentioned the fact that um, a lot of the boys have mentioned that you know we're noticing crowds at our games now, we're noticing some non familiar faces, and it's just it's just a positive time to be at the club, and like we we keep mentioning the the togetherness, the positive environment that we've created here, just. If you can just give us some last comments on how you think that's been and how you're looking forward to continuing that. Maybe things like the, the app coming out as well and the new website, like how we're we're just kind of making some, like we said, good foundations at the moment and just one way that continue to progress. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing's progressed hugely. And I just feel this has been the first year, the real first year of the club proper. We've also got the Alliance part and we touched on the supporters, people that, that we don't really know, new faces. And I see that. I see some kids coming up to myself or the players, you know, who have maybe been on the pitch before us and asking, you know, what we're all about, who are we, what we're doing, who do we, you know, who do we play in, what league do you play in? A couple of mums and, you know, dads have asked me the same questions. A couple of walkers run about the place when I've been in with the academy. They've asked me about, um, you know, the club essentially. So the local interest is certainly getting out there. The weaker the, the virus hit and I was actually due to go out to a school and going to present on uh, to the school kids about um, Caledonian Braves. So all that stuff is, is building foundations. And man, it's never going to be straight away we're going to get three, four, five hundred people. It's just mm -hmm. not going to happen. We don't have that community. You know, Kelty's got 120 year on of a mining community that has stayed in Kelty who, you know, come from Kelty and live in Kelty and um, you know, have got roots there. It's going to take us time to do that, but I think what we've done is genuinely phenomenal and probably think people maybe laugh at that, but they don't understand on the outside. You know, you look at your own job and how, you know, big the media side of things is now, that's content coming out. Um, you know, it's obviously getting pushed um, from Chris Massively, who's, who's a guy who doesn't want to stop pushing things, which is brilliant. You know, it's always pushing the matter as the smallest detail or the biggest detail, so... Um, and, and that's huge for us to, to continue that momentum. Um, we've ov obviously had a challenge, but we'll get over that. Mm. Um, we just want to keep it going. Um, like I say, I think the app is going to be the next thing. I know it's been a long, long time coming, but I feel maybe sometimes that, you know, sometimes that's just the way it works. You know, it's maybe, it, you know, come Christmas, it wasn't the right time. Come January, it wasn't the right time. So maybe this is the right time. Mm. The world's in a, a, a difficult place at the moment. and. I'd be having 
and that for about a club that, that they have no idea about might you know give them some hope you know tie them into a different and if football again in some capacity who knows we're, we're kind of giving out ideals here but um i just think it's been a fantastic year some of the results on the pitch have been really good some have, have not been good um, but we need to learn for that, those ups and downs, and we need to do that together. And we need to bring all that momentum, positivity, good times and bad times, and move on into next year and uh, try and make the whole thing better again. Brilliant. Um, so we'll finish up there. I just hope that um, everyone kind of understands you more as just not just the gaffer, you know, at the sideline, and maybe understand you as kind of your personality, who you are, you know, you're a good cook. Everyone knows that now. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to be asking for their dinners made but um, so just uh, thanks for coming on mate and just uh, giving a good well, look at um, and just just to say uh, to all the members fans and outside football world just stay safe everyone and just kind of pl- keep, keep being positive because I think it's been it's been really positive time at the moment with a lot of negatives at the same time so hopefully everyone can, can continue to do that yeah Precisely. No, everybody needs to keep calm, keep safe, and uh, we'll get through it. Right. Cheers, mate. Right. Uh, Cheers, man. See you the next one. Thanks very much, guys. Cheers.